Good afternoon. Welcome to First Parish. I know some of you have been here since the wee hours this morning, so welcome back to First Parish. This has been a day of wonderful celebration for our 325th anniversary as a congregation. First as a pilgrim congregational church, then as a Unitarian church, and now as a Unitarian Universalist church. I am very grateful to our cast and to our playwright, Don Cohen, for the presentation that you are about to see. It is an incredible honor for me to be minister of a congregation with such a talented crew of people. I'm getting the high sign. No, 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 sorry. no not the high sign. Okay, so this is about you as a congregation. This history that you're going to see is about the people, the real people, flesh and blood, loving, living people that have been in these pews, in this church for all of this time. So thank you for coming. I'm glad to see you all here, and I hope that you enjoy our wonderful presentation. Thank you. <coughs> well, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth, and I'm here to take you on a trip to the past of this congregation, First Parish in Lexington. Let's travel back in time together. Before the invention of the iPhone, before the computer, before television, the airplane, the automobile, before electric light, before the Civil War, before Darwin published The Origin of Species, before George Washington's first term as president, before the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, before the reigns of King George I, King George, oh, King George III, before, and King George II, and before King George I. A few years before Isaac Newton published the laws of motion he had discovered, before Lexington was Lexington. last decades of the 17th century, this place was part of Cambridge, known as Cambridge Farms. It was the home to about 30 families and 180 people in all, mostly farmers. Back then, a clear separation of church and state, as we understand it, did not exist in Massachusetts or anywhere else in America. Towns had one Calvinist church that everyone belonged to, and everyone was expected, that is required, to attend. The meeting house that held Sabbath services also served as a kind of town hall where what we might call secular business was conducted, except that the discussions and decisions weren't ever really entirely secular, being per, per, informed by the precepts of one Puritan church and powerfully influenced by the church's minister. The farmers and their families, and others who lived and worked here, were required to attend services every Sunday at a meeting house in Cambridge, located what is now the corner of Dunster and Mount Auburn Street. Let's ask Reverend Carlton Staples, minister of this church from 1881 to 1904, to describe what getting there must have been like. Staples was an avid student of the history of Lexington and First Parish, and a principal founder of the Lexington Historical Society. He will help us and guide us on our journey. Reverend Staples. Inhabitants were all taxed to support the church at Cambridge and were required to attend meeting there on the Sabbath, unless they had obtained leave to attend in some adjoining town, 
more convenient to them. Some were connected with the Watertown and some with the Concord Church. We can hardly imagine the hardships which church attendance often involved. The people riding on horseback, a distance of seven or eight miles, or in an ox cart over roads that were mere paths cut through the woods in cold and stormy weather, sometimes through deep snow or mud. Yet every person not disabled by sickness or old age was required to go. Children were not allowed to grow up without religious instruction and care. And settlements beyond a certain distance from the meeting house were discouraged and even prohibited in some towns. All must live within the sound of the church going bell or the meeting house drum. Even in good weather, it would take residents of Cambridge Farms more than an hour to get to Cambridge Meeting House on horseback. Once there, they sat through two long services, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and then the long trip home through growing darkness on winter afternoons. Not surprisingly, they grew tired of that demanding regime, and they raised the issue with the town of Cambridge, suggesting that they might set up a more convenient place of worship in Cambridge Farms. And they got no response. <laughs> so, in 1682, eight landowners of the farms petitioned the general court in Boston for the right to establish their own church describing the hardships of their travel to Cambridge and asserting their commitment to the practice of their religion. Your petitioners are located at a great distance, the near of them, nearest of them above five miles, some of them six, some seven, some eight, some nine, if not ten miles from the public place of meeting to worship God. Many of us have been forced to be absent at some seasons of the year, and especially our children, for whose spiritual good and the means leading thereunto, they desire to be solicitous as well as for themselves. There are now about 30 families in which are contained at least 180 souls within the circumstances and condition above mentioned. Fearing the sad effects of this remoteness from the public worship of God, and particularly in respect of their children and those that shall come after them, lest they should grow weary of attendance upon the public means of grace and think it too much to travel so many miles for such an end, and so should cease the worship of the Lord God of their fathers. The petitioners think it their bounden duty humbly to address this honorable court praying that by your favor they may be licensed to provide for themselves a person that may be able to dispense unto them the word of God and that they may be freed from the payments to the town of Cambridge, from whom, as their dear and beloved brethren, they in no ways desire separation for any other but the forementioned cause alone. Cambridge sent the court a counter-petition Having recently lost the area that was soon to become Newton, the town was feeling threatened and impoverished. One principal arm of our town is cut off, and our trade in this town so little and inconsiderable that it is even a wonder to ourselves how we do subsist and carry on so well as we do, though we do it not so well as we should. We therefore humbly present unto this honorable general court the great damage it will be to this poor church and town that have suffered so many diminutions already if the honored court should grant our farmers petition to let them have a ministry of their own. In 1684, the court found a compromise. This court, having heard the allegations and pleas of both parties, does order that the petitioners be licensed to erect the, for themselves a public meeting house and procure some able and orthodox minister, minister to dispense the ordinances of God amongst them. But the residents of Cambridge Farms would still need to pay for 
the maintenance of the Great Bridge over Charles River, the Grammar School, and not surprisingly, the charge of the deputies for the General Court. Before this could happen, though, the British Crown vacated, canceled, and annihilated the Massachusetts Bay Colony Charter. The General Court was disbanded and its decisions nullified. Massachusetts had to wait seven years for a new charter and a new court. That court essentially reinstated the earlier decision. So after seven additional years of long, hard travel to Cambridge Church every Sunday, the residents of Cambridge Farms finally got permission to establish their own church and hire their own minister in 1692. 325 years ago, they built a meeting house placed at the southern extremity of the common, probably halfway between the point where the Minuteman statue now stands and a watering trough that is no longer there. Reverend Staples describes the building. A plain, barn-like structure with rough boards and a shingle roof without steeple or paint. Inside the church there was neither plaster nor paint. The timbers were all exposed Rude benches extended fr uh, across from the middle aisle on either side to the outer aisles. The members of the new church drew up a covenant. Acknowledging our unworthiness of such a favor and unfitness for such a business, knowing how prone we are to backslide, yet apprehending ourselves to be called of God and relying on the Lord Jesus Christ alone for help, we covenant as follows. We acknowledge ourselves devoted to the fear and service of the only true God, our Supreme Lord, and to the Lord Jesus Christ, the High Priest, Prophet, and King of his Church, unto whose conduct we submit ourselves, and on whom alone we wait and hope for grace and glory, to whom we bind ourselves in an everlasting covenant never to be broke. We likewise give ourselves up one to another in the Lord, resolving by his help to plead each other to other as fellow members of one body in brotherly love and holy watchfulness over each other. And they called their first minister. In those days, it was usually a lifetime appointment. At a meeting of the inhabitants, it was voted that we will give Mr. Benjamin, Benjamin Estabrook a call to settle with us as our minister for time to come, till God's providence shall in other ways dispose of him. God's providence had, in fact, other plans for Reverend Estabrook. He died nine months after becoming the minister of the new church. His replacement, 27-year-old John Hancock, was ordained in 1698, 77 years before his grandson, also named John Hancock, would affix his name to the Declaration of Independence with a famous flourish. The church's second minister served for 54 years. As the town grew, the capacity of the little building house was increased by the addition of upper galleries. At his meeting on September 16, 1700, it was then agreed that they would build two upper galleries and put it into the hands of the assessors and committee to do it decently and well and to agree with ye workmen for the price of it. What was Sabbath service like in those early days? First of all, there was the important question of who sat where, Reverend Staples. On one side sat the men, on the other, the women, all seated according to their age, property, or importance in the community, magistrates and old people having seats nearest the pulpit. The seating of the meeting house was a matter of great difficulty and delicacy, causing often much hard and bitter feelings, since the estimate of a person's importance made by the committee often differed materially from his own. Here it was voted that in seating they, would, they should have respect only to real estate and to the head of the family, and that all people should bring in their ages before a certain date to the selectmen, that the seating may be correctly done. 
How strange and trivial this contention appears over the position of one's seat in the meeting where the people came to worship God. Whether the Bowmans were richer than the Bridges or the Monroes than the Reeds. The boys were on a bench in the rear where they might be inspected. Among those who sat in the gallery were the slaves, owned by the town's more prosperous farmers and professional men. Documentary evidence of the lives of Lexington slaves is scanty, but we know that there were 20 slaves in the town in the early 18th century out of a total population of 800. And we know some of their names. Jack, Dinah, Caesar, Phyllis, Prince Jonah, Pembo, Rose, Violet, Pompey, Peg, Sambo. The services were long. There were long prayers and longer sermons. Each sermon, one for the morning service and a different one in the afternoon, began with a quotation from scripture and often went on for well over an hour. There was unaccompanied hymn singing since no instruments were played in church in those days. My shepherd, you supply my need. Most holy is your name. My shepherd, you supply my need. Most holy is your name. In pastures fresh you make me feed beside the living stream. In pastures fresh you make me feed beside the living stream. You bring my wandering spirit back when I forsake your ways. You bring my wandering spirit back when I forsake your ways. You lead me for your mercy's sake in paths of truth and grace. You lead me for your mercy's sake in paths of truth and grace. Public confessions were a regular part of the Sunday ritual. I, Deborah Jackson, desire to go humbled before the Lord greatly for all my sins, especially for the sin of intemperance into which I have fallen to the dishonor of God, of religion, and the dishonor of myself. I desire to give glory to God by making confession of my sins and to do it in this place. I hope God has made me sensible of my mistakes and has made the sin bitter to my mind and will help me to watch over myself more narrowly. I pray God I may be delivered from the temptations of it and honestly desire you will pray for me. We, we James, James and Mary, Mary Russell, Russell, having, having been, been left by God to fall into scandalous evil, whereby we have dishonored God, wronged our souls, and aggrieved others, desire to be humbled before God for this our offense, heartily begging forgiveness both of God and of his people, wherein we have offended them in this or in any other thing, entreating that God would teach us hereby to be more watchful over ourselves and to see how prone we are to be carried away by temptation, that we may more carefully watch and pray that we may not fall into temptation. The Confession of Benjamin Bate, read in Open Assembly at Lexington, June 14, 1716, was for killing John Lawrence's cow the night before last, leaving the axe in its body. 
notwithstanding all the threatening of God and warning of the minister against the manner of sin, especially presumptuous sins, yet through the temptation of the devil and my corrupt heart, I, being safely taken captive by the devil, fell into the sin of revenge, of destroying my neighbor's estate, which was not only against man, but greatly to the dishonor of God and religion, which I humbly confess, begging your forgiveness and prayers for me, as God, I hope, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me and made me welcome into gospel privileges. We can assume that the humane and sensible Reverend Hancock responded to his parishioners' faults by firmly but gently helping them regain the right path. As Reverend Staples tells us, he was Calvinistic, but of the milder sort, with a strong leaning towards mercy. Hancock was, however, aware of the people's failings. He once said, for instance, Some men will marry their children to swine for a golden trough. He was not a theological or ecclesiastical fossil, but a man of real flesh and blood, with a warm, beating heart, a man in close touch with humanity in its manifold expression and experience. In a sermon entitled, Ministers Are the People's Helpers, Hancock said, Let us all be thankful that we are delivered from a domineering and tyrannical clergy whose tendency is to damn all the world but themselves. He was also, says Staples, a man who was abreast of the knowledge and progress of his time. We can think of him as a man of Unitarian tendencies long before the church became officially Unitarian. He was thoughtfully skeptical about Orthodox beliefs. In one sermon, he questions the biblical account of the flood. How was it possible, if the flood was universal, for water enough to have fallen in 40 days to have covered the tops of the highest mountains? He uses mathematics to calculate that it would, in fact, have taken more than 40 years to have drowned the earth, and then wonders where all that water could have gone when the flood ended. Hancock was fond of wit and not above perpetrating a joke. We have the story of his call upon the family of a wealthy parishioner when the wife asked him if he would partake of some refreshment, to which he readily assented. Placing before him her largest and best cheese, she bade him help himself. But madam, he asked, where shall I cut this fine cheese? Anywhere you please, sir, was the answer. Well then, I will cut it at home, he replied. <laughs> he, 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 he replied and accordingly carried it away with him. <laughs> then, as now, there were basic, essential church chores to be done. Benjamin Muzzy was employed to ring the bell on Sabbaths, at burials, and on lecture days, to sweep the meeting house, keep the basin, and bring the water for baptizing, for all of which he was paid the sum of one pound, 15 shillings per annum. No one would have guessed that John Hancock's ministry, begun before the end of the 17th century, would last beyond the midpoint of the 18th. During his 54 years in the pulpit, the town and the church grew and changed. On March 20, 1713, the general court approved the town's petition to separate entirely from Cambridge. Ordered that the aforesaid tract of land known by the name of the Northern Precinct of Cambridge be henceforth made a separate and distinct town by the name of Lexington. The quickly constructed first meeting house which had provided basic shelter and seating for worshipers for 10 years became so dilapidated that it was torn down and replaced by a new structure in 1714. The second meeting house was larger but still plain, more like a barn than our idea of what a traditional New England church looks like. Like the first meeting house, it was a town building paid for by town taxes with no distinction between religious and secular authority. For instance, the selectmen order that husband and wife shall sit together with their family if there be room convenient. Hancock was a good man in many, many ways, but he was a man of his time. His questioning mind did not question at all the practices of his culture. In 1728, 
the town of Lexington allocated 85 pounds to buy a slave for John Hancock to take care of the parsonage while he concentrated on the demands of his ministry. The long and successful ministry of John Hancock came to an end in 1752. The circumstances and significance of his passing were described by Nathaniel Appleton in a pair of sermons printed in a pamphlet whose title was almost as long as its contents. It was called The Servant's Actual Readiness for the Coming of His Lord, Described and Recommended. In two discourses preached at Lexington, December 17th, 1752, being the Lord's Day after the funeral of their late venerable and aged pastor, the Reverend Mr. John Hancock, who going to bed as well as usual the night after the 5th of December and awaking sometime after midnight with a great pain in his stomach, died in a few minutes on the 82nd year of his age and 54th of his ministry. After the death of Mr. Hancock, the town needed a new minister and chose a committee to make diligent inquiry after a gentleman suitable to settle. After hearing a number of candidates preach, a few Sabbaths each, the town voted to keep a day of fasting and prayer on the 25th of April in preparation for said choice. The church and society in June 1754 called Mr. Aaron Putnam to be their new minister. But he declined because the vote in his favor was not unanimous. Nearly a year later, Mr. Jonas Clark received an invitation to become minister at a salary of 80 pounds and 20 cords of wood a year. His ministry would last 50 years. So Hancock and Clark led the church from the late 17th century to the beginning of the 19th. Between them, they preached over 4,000 sermons, tens of millions of words praising God, and urging parishioners to be good Christians and good citizens. Speaking of continuity, Clark married Hancock's granddaughter Lucy before he had completed the second year of his ministry. They had 13 children. In addition to his church duties, Clark farmed the 55 acres he had been granted, planting and harvesting crops, keeping a daily journal of events, and careful accounts of transactions. On one occasion, though, after entering some complicated figures, he noted, the above is somehow wrong. Unlike his predecessor, Clark did not own a slave, although slavery was not abolished in Massachusetts until 1783. During Clark's ministry, the church organized its first choir. Safely through another week, God has brought us on our way. Let us now In the 18th century, the town of Lexington dealt with the kinds of problems familiar to towns through the centuries. For instance, Whereas there is complaint made to the selectmen against Christopher Mason, Jr., that he is very disorderly and threatens his parents and lives idly and neglects to provide for his family, but the rather destroys what they have by stealing household stuff and spending the money for drink. Wherefore, the selectmen have appointed Mr. Samuel Winship, one of the selectmen, to proceed with him as the law directs. And then there was the trouble surrounding the new town bell, a gift from Isaac Stone in 1761. The 463 pound bell was hung in a belfry, which is now called, which is on what is now called Belfry Hill land then belonging to Lieutenant Jonas Monroe. But Monroe insisted the town pay rent for that bit of barren granite. Town meeting refused, and the belfry was moved to Mr. Hudson's property. Soon after, Parsons Unknown moved it to the common in the middle of the night. A special session of town meeting was called. 
to see if the town cannot agree to some place for the bell and belfry to stand that may have a tendency to make peace in the town. After much discussion, they decided to keep it on the green. They had a door cut in on one side of the belfry so the town hearse could be parked inside. Fortunately, given how long he led the church and the town, Reverend Clark was widely admired. He was a good pastor and he was a statesman worthy of all praise, honor, and imitation. He was a good citizen, leader, counselor, and friend. In those days, the minister was the most powerful person in Lexington, leader of the church and the parish as a whole. Clark's qualities and the respect he inspired reinforced his influence. He was a peacemaker. If Smith and Jones came to any war of words more or less angry, upon agreement to refer the matter to Parson Clark, the scene at once brightened and the storm cloud was sure to be dispelled. The contestants came and related and argued and the decision was quick and final. Jones, your bull is a burly and dangerous animal and should be shut up in a barn or barnyard. And Smith, if your fences had been kept in better order, your ox would not have been gored. Go, both of you, and do your duty and shake hands as friends. And this was sure to be done. Clark was a peacemaker, but also a powerful advocate for the rights and liberty of the colonists, and eventually for the armed resistance to tyranny that became the American Revolution. He preached opposition to the Stamp Act of 1765, which taxed all documents in the colonies. That the world may see and future generations know that the present generation both know and value the rights they enjoyed and did not tamely resign them for slaves, for slavery or chains. In 1773, three days before the Boston Tea Party, Lexington citizens burned all their tea in a common bonfire to protest the tea tax imposed by Britain. Reverend Clark made this declaration to town meeting. If the head of any family shall from this time forward purchase any tea or use or consume any tea in their families, such person shall be looked upon as an enemy to this town and to this country and shall by this town be treated with neglect and contempt. And in the same year, he declared, The preservation of the rights and liberties of the people is the cause of God. Militia men who engage in the cause of God's people and set themselves for their defense are therefore to consider themselves as guardians and trustees for God, having the right, property, liberties, and lives of their fellow men, a sacred trust committed to their charge. The people of Lexington voted in favor of the following statement written by Reverend Clark. Should the state of our affairs require it, we shall be ready to sacrifice our estates and everything dear in life, yes, and life itself in support of the common cause. Reverend Clark's urging brought the small company of Minutemen, his parishioners, to the green on that fateful April 19, 1775. After that morning, he said, From the 19th day of April 1775, we may venture to predict will be dated in future history the liberty or slavery of the American world. According as a sovereign God shall see fit to smile or frown upon the interesting cause in which we are engaged. Carlton Staple evokes the role of that second meeting house on that April morning when a little company of Lexington farmers were drawn up behind it to defend their rights with their lives. What a scene it witnessed on that fateful, on that eventful morning. Seventy or eighty men hastily summoned from their homes standing there in their homespun clothing, armed with their old fowling pieces, to face a battalion of the best disciplined troops in the world. 
and ready to lay down their lives for justice and liberty, for home and country, and the right of mankind. And into that old meeting house were borne the bodies of the slain and laid upon the floor of its aisles after the bloody work was done. With the war raging and the outcome <coughs> uncertain, Clark preached a sermon on that first anniversary of the battle, describing it in these passionate words. A brigade of those instruments of violence and tyranny make their approach with the morning's light, and more like murderers and cutthroats than the troops of a Christian king, without provocation, without warning, when no war was proclaimed, they draw the sword of violence upon the inhabitants of this town, and with cruelty and barbarity, they shed innocent blood. Yonder field can witness the innocent blood of our brethren slain. They bleed, they die, not in their own cause only, but in the cause of this whole people, in the cause of God, their country, and posterity. They have not bled, they shall not bleed in vain. The historic significance of the second meeting house, where Clark preached his doctrine of revolution, didn't protect it from the needs and ambitions of the growing parish. It was torn down in 1794 and replaced by a grander structure built on the common like its predecessors. The third meeting house was regarded as a noble edifice far more comfortable than the old one, with a lofty steeple, three spacious vestibules, and a large bell which could be heard all over the town, bringing the people to meeting, bringing them to bed at nine o'clock at night, tolling when they died to tell everybody how old they were, and when their bodies were borne to the last resting place. It had some pretensions to architectural beauty, and what doubtless pleased the people not a little was its superiority to the Concord Meeting House, <laughs> it being much more spacious and comfortable. It was painted pea green. <laughs> the construction cost was defrayed by the sale of pews, the most desirable going for $174. When a pew became available, a flag inscribed with the words, for sale, was hoisted over it. It was unheated at first, but then two enormous stoves were soon added. One man was so offended at the innovation that he never attended meeting afterward. <laughs> the war won, the Republic established, Jonas Clark lived out his final decades as a minister, town leader, and farmer. The last diary entry of his life reads, Finished haying. In 1805, he was gathered to his fathers, full of years and honors, though not of riches, as the inventory of his, his estate plainly shows, where the old horse is put down at $8 and the chaise at $3, each of his heirs receiving about $130. Reverend Staples' statistical comparison between Clark's era and his own attests to the changes in child mortality. Reverend Jonas Clark recorded 556 funerals, of which 202, or over 36%, are of infants and children, and 218 marriages. I have recorded 238 funerals, of which barely 7% are of children under 12 years and 59 weddings. The first parish was still the one and only church in town. Late in life, Francis Brown, remembers the church of his youth. As there was but one church in the town, we had but one prevailing sentiment to, to cherish, one cluster of dogmas to examine, and one conclusion set forth to arrive at. So we had little to excite discussion, and we patiently took what was given us and waited, wished, and wondered according to our peculiar circumstances. One thing I ought to acknowledge, however, we had very long discourses, often requiring a full hour in their delivery and sometimes an hour and a half, two of them surely on each Sunday so that if any fell short in quality, 
It was made up and presented in quantity. <laughs> he didn't always have his mind on the sermons. And here are a few words respecting the pulpit, which was in those days considered a place of so much sacredness that few, save the authorized ones, had courage to enter it. It was made of pine and painted white, with access given to it by a flight of six or seven steps on each side. Overhead hung, suspended by an iron rod, a sounding board, circular in form, coming down to within 12 or 18 inches of the minister's head. And, and this, I well remember, frequently disturbed my, my juvenile apprehensions, lest it might fall upon and crush the poor preacher below. In the first decades of the 19th century, town after town in Massachusetts witnessed turmoil in its soul church with conflict between liberal members drawn to Unitarians, Unitarianism's embrace of reason and uh, the rejection of original sin and the conservatives who cherished a belief in the Trinity and Jesus as the divine redeemer of innate human sinfulness. The losers of those battles Congregationalists in some cases, and Unitarians in others, often built a new church near the one they left. The battles were sometimes bitter. In Dedham, for instance, the victorious Unitarians were incensed that their more conservative brethren, or ex-brethren, constructed a congregational church directly across High Street. So incensed that they went to the trouble and expense of lifting their church building and turning it 90 degrees so that they would not have to look at the offending structure as they walked out their front door after Sunday services. In Lexington, no such conflict took place. The congregation as a whole had gradually become more liberal over the years, led by a succession of liberal-minded ministers that stretched back to John Hancock when it declared itself Unitarian in 1819, with little or no recorded discussion, it was essentially recognizing an established fact. Theodore Parker, grandson of Captain John Parker, who led the Minuteman on April 19th, grew up in this church. Born in 1810, he became a Unitarian minister and a prominent transcendentalist who called for the abolition of slavery. His uncompromising stand brought threats to his safety, and he kept a pistol in his desk. In a mid-century sermon, Parker wrote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. But from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. Things refused to be mismanaged long. Jefferson trembled when he thought of slavery and remembered that God is just. Ere long, all America will tremble. More than a hundred years later, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. would echo those words to inspire men and women at a later stage of black Americans' continuing struggle for freedom and equality. In 1845, the parish voted to remodel the meeting house. Before the job was finished, the structure caught fire and burned to the ground. In 1847, a committee was formed to oversee the building of a new meeting house, the one you are now sitting in. Because Massachusetts had finally voted for the separation of church and state, the last state in the country to do so, the fourth meeting house would be constructed off the town's common land on the other side of what was then Elm Street, now Harrington Road. The building at that time consisted of the vestibule and sanctuary with 100 horse sheds nearby. In the 1850s, new members proclaimed their belief in Jesus Christ as the all-sufficient Savior and in the Christian Church as the best means of carrying out the purposes of Christ in this world. In 1875, more than 100,000 people flocked to Lexington to celebrate the nation's centennial. The following Sunday, First Parish Minister Henry Westcott preached. There is something which the recent surprising manifestation of interest should teach us as citizens of this historic town. 
It is that we have a duty to preserve and increase that interest, not for the honor of the town, but for the benefit of the nation. In 1879, the congregation voted to use water instead of wine at communion. Shortly thereafter, however, an unobjectionable wine having been procured, the old custom was restored by general consent. <laughs> May 12, 1885. The women of the first parish in Lexington, Massachusetts, do now form themselves into a branch of the Women's Auxiliary Conference in the hope of securing closer union and more effective work among themselves and of extending their sympathy and fellowship to others. The group became known as the Alliance. Members discussed issues affecting the church and society and raised money for many causes. April 6, 1897. Miss Lillian Clark's letter asking aid for the Armenian refugees was considered and the ladies agreed to be responsible for $12, that being the sum required to support one or orphan for one year. Those who take food home in dishes belonging to the church kitchen are asked to return them as promptly as possible, as they are in frequent demand. The annual meeting of 1890 voted to enlarge the parish committee from three to five members, two of whom shall be ladies. Within two years, the all-male three-person committee was restored. Before the turn of the century, Reverend Staples drew up a new covenant for members of the church. In presenting yourselves here to unite with this Christian church, do you confess your faith in God, our Father, in Christ, our teacher and savior, and in the life immortal? And is it your sincere purpose to follow Christ as he is revealed in your own mind and heart? We, we whose names are here subscribed, unite, unite together as, as a Christian, Christian church in the faith of Jesus Christ, Christ and, and for the study and practice of his religion. religion. We, we will strive to do all the good we can to help one another and to be faithful followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church's first organ was installed in the gallery at the rear of the sanctuary of the New Meeting House. And in 1897, it was replaced by the current instrument.
during World War I, First Parish, Hancock Church, and the Episcopal Church instituted joint services to conserve fuel. Leaders of First, First Parish judged the experience inspiring and enlightening, which didn't prevent the three churches from giving up the practice when the war ended. Shortly after the war, a layman's league was formed and adopted this statement of faith. We worship the living God, our Father, and our friend. We are disciples of Jesus of Nazareth, teacher of the love of God and the way of life. We believe in the infinite worth of man and his power of unending growth. We believe in liberty, democracy, and law as essential to human progress. When the Second World War began, several thousand Lexingtonians gathered on the green and repeated the words Jonas Clark wrote more than 150 years earlier. To sacrifice our estates and everything dear in life, yea, and life itself in support of the common cause. May 12, 1948. Mrs. Barbara Pierce suggested a clothing exchange as a money-making project. Later called the Steeple Shop, it became a source of affordable quality clothing for the area and earned many thousands of dollars for the Alliance during its more than 50 years. During Floyd Taylor's ministry, which began shortly after the end of World War II, congregants recited this creed during services. We, we believe in the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood, brotherhood of man, the leadership of Jesus, salvation by character and faith, and, and the unlimited possibilities that are the birthright of every human soul. From the Minutes of the Alliance. I told my sister, who was at Harvard Law School, that we were hard put to find any poor in Lexington to help. She said, that's because they are hidden. Sure enough, we found Puerto Rican migrant workers all over the town farms in Lexington. The men were brought here for the growing season without families, not allowed to leave the farm or have visitors except for a priest from Lawrence. With the help of four or five from our church, we began to visit the farms and attempt to teach English. Gerta and I went one evening a week to a farm on Waltham Street to teach English, but it was so frustrating. The men were illiterate in Spanish, too, and so tired from their long work day. The only enlightened farm family were the Schumachers on Wood Street, who at last could influence the others, though some would rather go out of business than act humanely. We were asked if we wanted the price of vegetables to go up. John Wells became the minister in 1968. A lawyer and former Defense Department employee turned minister, he mobilized the church to protest the undeclared war in Vietnam. Like Jonas Clark some 200 years earlier, he helped shape Massachusetts' response to what he considered and unjust and unlawful actions by the government. He was directly responsible for the passage of the Shea Wells Bill by the Massachusetts General Court, which stated, No citizen of Massachusetts in the military forces of the United States shall be required to serve outside the continental limits of the United States in a combat zone for more than 60 days from the time of commencement of said hostilities unless the Congress has declared that a state of war exists. In 1977, a group of First Parish laywomen developed a resolution on women and religion and submitted it to the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly. Calling for the elimination of sexist assumptions and language and the celebration of women's experience in the quest for religious identity it was resoundingly approved and has influenced UU values and practices ever since. In 1980, 288 years after its founding, the church called Helen Lutton Cohen as its 21st parish minister, the first woman to join the ranks of Hancock, Clark, Staples, Taylor, Wells, and the others. During her tenure, First Parish became a welcoming congregation committing itself to welcome and support lesbian, gay, bisexual, 
and transgender members and friends. The church became fully accessible for the first time with the addition of its elevator. On the first Sunday of its operation, a Lexington couple with a son in a wheelchair came to the service, saying they had been waiting for First Parish to be available to their whole family. They remained valued members of the congregation for many years. First Parish no had longer had a covenant with which members had to agree. Under the leadership of Reverend Cohen and the Director of Religious Education, Ellen Brandenburg, it adopted a unison affirmation, which we recite every Sunday. Love, Love is, is the doctrine, doctrine of this, this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and, and service is its prayer. prayer. This is our great covenant, covenant to dwell together in peace, peace to seek the truth in love, and to help one another to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. The current minister, Reverend Ann Mason, is the 24th settled minister of First Parish in Lexington and the second woman to hold that position in the church's 325-year history. We have arrived back at this present moment Early December 2017, this brief, particular instance in our continuing history at First Parish in Lexington. Though he died more than 100 years ago, let's call on Reverend Carlton Staples once more to pronounce a wish and a benediction for this gathering before we depart. He spoke these words in December of 1891. May the old parish and all other parishes in the town be ever reaching out and pressing on towards a better life for body, mind, and soul in their people, and a better life for the state and the nation. Amen. Whether we know it or not, we are having our own small effect on the future direction of this church's voyage through time. Never knowing fully what that effect will be, knowing only that it is our desire and duty to ensure the survival of First Parish and do what we can to make it a force for good, a comforter, and an inspiration to action. We cannot know what that future will be or how future members, perhaps sitting in this very sanctuary, will describe how they will describe our contribution. But we hope that they will say our link in this unbroken chain called First Parish in Lexington is a strong one, faithful to the noble traditions and brave aspirations of this place. <laughs>